But to kick things off, so for those of you who haven't joined some of our boot camps before, uh, this is uh, part five. Um, and this session is all about thinking about the importance of internal communications, really for building an innovative, innovative culture in your organization. So that's thinking about, I like to use the three E's. So how can we excite our employees about the impact that they can have in their program? How can we educate them about the types of ideas we're looking for? How can we educate them about their role in the innovation program? And then how can we empower them? How can we empower them to know how they should be getting involved, but also to make sure that they can be empowered so that wherever they're out and about and they have an idea, they know what and it will be listened and if you haven't joined our sessions before it's okay to be joining uh, this session in isolation because in some ways yes it's great if you are coming into this session with a familiarity of what your goals are um, and what your workflow is but it's also an opportunity to think about uh, the strategy uh, from from the get-go and think about how that feeds into your goals and so forth and I guess if there's, if there's three takeaways from this session uh, that I'm really keen that you guys take away, it's really about the importance of an internal communication strategy, the best way to launch it. So making sure from the get go, we're thinking about uh, best practices and how we can be setting ourselves up to make sure that we're consistently learning and developing from our communications as we go. And then also how can we make sure that we're driving that consistent engagement beyond the launch? And I think just before we head into uh, the workshop, I guess as a bit of inspiration, I wanted to share with you some of my favorite comms from the clients um, that we've been working with. And the reason I've chosen some of these comms, so on the left-hand side, we have this uh, guide to idea drop, and this was created by a bone marrow organization. And what they did is think about uh, an infographic, a one sort of pager, to make sure all employees knew uh, why they go to this innovation program and how they can get involved. And another one to shout out is all the different ways that our clients are recognizing their employees, whether that's internally through uh, emails and through uh, progress impact reports that they're showcasing across their organization, but also externally where they put themselves forward for innovation awards. So I hope that serves as a bit of inspiration um, going into the next session. I'm now going to hand over to Liam, Victoria and Adam from H&K Strategies. Hi, thank you um, very much, Caitlin. Um, my name is Victoria Entwistle and I lead our internal communications practice at Hill and Elton Strategies. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the company, we are a global public relations agency. We're part of um, the WPP group with about 80 um, offices worldwide. We sit in London, although I'm beaming to you live from H&K Suffolk today, so sole employee of the, of the Suffolk office while, uh, while we all get used to, to another lockdown um, here in, in England. Um, we support all sorts of companies in their internal communications, change and engagement from um, gaming companies to healthcare companies, we do a lot of work in the tech space, also in public sector as well, so a whole range of environments. And what we're going to share with you today is actually a, um, a summary of some of the work that we've been doing with the European Central Bank to help um, engage and change their leaders in terms of internal communication and what kind of things to think about when launching change, which with innovation is clearly a big, a big part of that. So um, I'll hand over to Adam and Liam who will share a little bit more about themselves and then we'll kick off. Yeah, thanks Vicky. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Flitton. I'm a, a behavioural scientist in H&K's behavioural science team. Um, I'm an experimental psychologist by background, so I help uh, everyone in H&K um, working across sectors to help to sort of change behaviours. Um, so lots of stuff in healthcare, as kind of suggested, also things like tech and sport and so on. A lot of retail stuff as well, as you'd imagine. But also a lot of the things that I do are working in workplaces. So applying insights from organizational psychology and so on to, you know, and finding those kinds of evidence-based solutions to encourage things like 
innovation and risk taking and ownership and all those kinds of words that everyone thinks are really exciting in the workplace. So I'll, have, I'll hand over to Liam. Thanks, Adam. Hello, everyone. Um, it's Liam Earl here. So um, I think I may have met a few of you um, at one of the first sessions a few months back. So hello to those familiar faces. Um, I'm a consultant at uh, Hill and Alton Strategies. I work within the People and Purpose team um, and we specialize in uh, employee engagement, culture change and internal communications. So work across a wide variety of uh, clients. Um, as I say, you know, variety is the spice of life. So um, we're kept very busy and yeah, it's um, it's a yeah, it's a great team to be a part of working, working on such a diverse range of clients. So I'm um, so very excited to be presenting to you today. Great, so I think Liam is in charge of tech, so we wait for the magic to happen. Um, great, so what we want to take away, and um, Caitlin obviously kind of shared this, you know, what are the kind of ingredients for an internal communications plan, um, why you need one, um, how to best launch your innovation initiative internally, and we're going to spend little bit of time today really thinking about um, human behavior and some of the underlying um, kind of changes that people go through and how to incorporate that into your internal comms plan and then looking at getting consistent engagement with your innovation initiative so we're conscious that we've got kind of a shortest time so um, we will do our best to kind of do theory, discussion, and a little bit of working, both personal working and group working. Um, and we will leave you um, within the next 24 hours, we'll make sure that you have this pack and also a little set of planning tools. And I'll show you those planning tools in a moment, but we'll make sure that you get sent a copy of those after as well. So I think you will find those, those really useful. But first, it would not be a workshop if we didn't put you through uh, the excruciating moment of an icebreaker. So I'm going to uh, hand over to, uh, to Adam to kick things off a little bit. Oh, I think Adam's frozen. You there, Adam? Sorry about that. Just as I thought it was my turn to speak, I noticed that my internet had died. So there we are. Good, classic working from home. Um, Thank you for that. So I'll, I'll kick us off then. So don't worry, it says icebreaker here, but this isn't a traditional icebreaker. I'm not going to ask you to tell me two truths and a lie or doing anything embarrassing. Um, I just really wanted to start us off by illustrating in a, in a really simple way um, why the sort of behavioral science based approach kind of in, underpins everything we're going to talk about implicitly and also we'll kind of bring it up explicitly at a few points. Um, that we're going to talk about today. I want to just kind of illustrate why it's important. And to do that, I'm going to I'm going to run a really quick experiment with everyone on the call, if that's okay. Um, so if everyone could grab a pen and paper or some way they, where they can write stuff stuff down, maybe open Microsoft Word or Notepad or something like that, whatever it is. Um, all I'm going to do, just very simply, um, is I'm going to read a list of. It sounds boring, but I promise you it's not. I'm going to read a list of words, um, and then after I'm finished. I just want you to write down all of the words that you can remember. And I'll give you about 20 seconds to, to do that. Um, so normally in person, I can police when people are cheating and writing while I'm reading. So please don't do that. It's not a test. Um, it's, it's just for interest. Um, so assuming that everyone's had enough time to get something, I'm, I'm gonna read uh, a list of words now. So please don't start writing until I finish. But when, I, when I've finished, I'll say write, and then please do just try and write down as many as you can possibly remember, all right? So. Here we go. Dream, bed, night, mattress, snooze, sheet, nod, tired, night, artichoke, insomnia, doze, blanket, night, alarm, nap, snore, pillow. And write as many as you can. I'll give you about 20 seconds or something like that. I'll assume that's probably about enough time for everyone. So what I'm going to do now is I'm basically going to ask 
which words we all remembered. I'm not going to pick on anyone, but please do. We've got a chat thing here. So please maybe just type in your chat. I'll ask some questions, then just answer if you remember them or not. And most of the, the, the uptake, the up, kind of upshot from this is that most of you will remember probably the same words and you'll have forgotten the same words. So the first question I'm going to ask everyone is, how many of the words did you remember? If you can just type in the chat so I can see, because I can't see anyone's face. So how many, if you count up on your list, how many did you get? Oh, lots of people answering, this is great. Okay, cool. All right, so nice. So everyone's really good. Everyone's in about the same sort of ballpark. So we're going from about six to sort of 13-ish, great, really good. So the first thing to note um, is that, so I read 18 words in total. So we've already forgotten, even though we're really closely focusing on this particular task, I was only asking you to, to do one thing, for some people, for lots of people, a lot of that information, often about half, has already gone. So we can only, the first insight to bear in mind as we talk, as we go on is we can only take in so much information, even if we're really focusing. When we're not paying attention, imagine how much we can take in, like even less, right? So can you tell me in the chat if, um, if you remembered the words dream and pillow? Lots of yeses, oh, a lot of yeses. Okay, great. Um, so there's a special reason why you probably did that. So again, lots of commonalities and people remember this word. Lots of people forgot others. And the reason for this, you might be able to guess is that they were the first and last things that I read. So in, in the jargon, this is what's called primacy and recency effects. So things that are the, at the beginning of a series and things that are at the end of a series, we tend to remember really well, but stuff in the middle tends to get lost. Um, great, perfect. So who remembered, and type in the chat again, who remembered the word artichoke? I wonder if this is going to be everyone. It's probably going to be everyone. But lots of people. Oh, some people said no. Okay, great. So again, this is, this is another word commonly um, remembered, should be remembered by most of you, not all of you, but it tends to be one of the words in the list that gets remembered really well. Um, and it's probably for quite an obvious reason, which is that people remember things that are distinctive and a bit different, right? So the stuff that I was reading had a really common theme, right? It was like, you know, bedtime and snoozing and so on. But artichoke is completely different. So things that are distinctive stand out and they're the kinds of things that we remember even when we forget others. Brilliant. Um, another word, who remembered the word night? This is probably gonna be everyone. So great. So, so often, just given what I just said about things being distinctive, so often we can be, as comms people, right, we can be tempted to try and do things new all the time, try and be distinctive all the time. But yeah, as people are saying in the chat, I said the word night three times. So we get a repetition effect, right? So even if it might be tempting for us to do new things all the time, um, repeating and giving a, a consistent message is something that evidence suggests and our nice little study suggests is something that can make things really memorable. Finally, last one, who remembered the word sleep? Quite a few people, some people saying no, great. And um, brilliant. So the, the answer really here is that I didn't read the word sleep at all. It wasn't on the list that I said, but the insight that's important here is that um, our brain sort of closes logical gaps in sequences, right? So I read a lot of words that are about snoozing and bedtime and mattresses and snoring, which, but I didn't say the word sleep. So all of those things are cueing you, um, are creating a kind of weird gap. Um, and it's, it's a classic false memory effect, basically, where people will really strongly believe that, okay, I definitely heard that. But in reality, unconsciously, our brain is just filling in the gaps. So great, um, that's really useful. Uh, so it actually it tends to be that normally about between sort of about 20% and a third of people uh, who I read that list to will say they remember sleep even though it wasn't on the list. So that's brilliant. Great. So the point of this really is just to very quickly show that there's, there's variation in the kinds of things we attend to and remember, right? You didn't preferentially try to remember these words, right? It just happened as a result of the way your memory works, the way your brain works. And the reasons for that variation aren't random, right? They're the result of processes that are under, uh, under investigation by scientists. And so as behavioral scientists, our approach is to use this knowledge to improve communications, right? To use those kinds of things we've just learned about, um, including for things like internal change, to engage people and to encourage them to, to take action.
Thank you, Adam. So um, one of the reasons why that's so important and we use it to underline kind of the work we do when we're working with organisations through change is the fact that change programmes actually don't have a great success rate. Gartner's own um, research into this says 50 to 70 percent of change programmes are set to fail due to that lack of engagement. Um, Power Watson has similar data, you know, you can look this up yourself. Um, and really the sort of most cited rationale is communication and communication not being effective enough. So some of the um, little tricks around the human brain that Adam just shared with you um, then are really useful to build into your communications um, to help messages stick and to help people um, you know, uh, engage with what it is that you're trying to, to do. Um, so I know you've all been focusing around innovation and I know probably some of the previous sessions have kind of un unpicked that. We won't dwell on this too much. Um, Adam and I do work with a lot of organisations to help them understand what innovation means to them. And I guess there was a, such a strong thread in that work that we've done with other clients that we thought it would be useful sharing with you that innovation alone isn't going to get you to where you want to get to. You need to really have a behaviour thing. You need people to also be willing to take more risks in order to be innovative. And um, so in order to have success in any innovation program, you really do need to think about changing people's behaviour um, and in particular how you can get people from uh, moving from maybe being a bit more risk averse to being a bit more risk taking. And that's not always sort of easy because we uh, approach change in different ways. Um, you may or may not be familiar with this um, model. Um, it was originally actually developed by Elizabeth Publer Ross to look at um, the journey we take through in grief. Um, but um, it's a similar approach actually to change depending on, on the change. And we all go through this at, at different speeds. So, you know, people, first of all, they're dealing with their normal reality, very much so when you're working, you have a set job to do, you're doing that. Someone suggests we have to change this. That makes you worry. It makes you feel I'm overwhelmed. How am I going to cope? Can I do this? Um, and then over time, you get to a point where you're like, okay, maybe this isn't as bad. Maybe I can see the, the advantage of moving this way. And you start to move into a more positive um, aspect. But we all go through that at different speeds. Um, it's important when you're planning your internal communications to find those people that can move through a change much quicker because they are really helpful people for you. They're your sort of advocates that you can involve. And internal communications plays a really powerful role in change because it helps to sort of smooth out um, those peaks and troughs that we showed you. Um, and really you're about thinking about where are your audience, where are they now, where do we want to get them to, and how are we going to get them and using communications to help kind of flatten, flatten that change curve for them. So how do you go about doing that? Well, um, you could do that over a <laughs> two, two day workshop, but we're gonna do this in a quick sort of, uh, sort of hour, uh, 90 minute session. But we've put together some tools for you that as I said, we'll go through um, relatively high level and we'll have a chance to experiment with them a little bit today on your own and in group and then you'll be able to take these tools away and use them for your own planning um, and we'd obviously be happy to kind of help you through that that process so um first thing um and probably a bit hard to do in covid no one's dating at the moment but if you were <laughs> the first thing to think about when you're doing your internal communications plan is less about you and more about the person that you're um, communicating with. So um, when we're on a date, we probably aren't going to get a second date if we spend the whole time talking about ourselves. You're much more likely to progress to the next day if you um, show, show interest and ask 
questions and really engage and involve that person. And I think that's a really sort of sweet little anecdote to think about when you're doing your internal comms planning. Okay, yeah, I obviously want to get to the second date, but how best am I going to get to the second date? How best am I going to engage with people? And that is through involving them throughout and thinking about your audience and who you're, you're talking to. Um, so I'm going to have to shift my little buttons a bit so I can see this in full. Hopefully, can you all see this in full? Sorry, I'm not in the room with you. So. Brilliant, okay, because um, I've got some of it truncated. Um, so this really, um, as I said, and we built, built this for a number of clients, but we use it very deeply with the European um, Central Bank and use it um, as, a, as a course to take them through that. So your internal comms planning toolkit. So first of all, you need to think about your brief. So what is it that we're doing and why? And what is the impact going to be on employees? What's my role in making it happen? Um, have a brainstorm around what some of the potential barriers to success are going to be. So what's going to get in the way of that? And for me, how am I going to measure that success? So how will I know that I've been you know, successful? Um, and that could be, you know, is it an adoption rate? Is it a change in behavior? Is it increased productivity? There may be a number of KPIs that you are being measured on. Is it, you know, more ideas coming through and how many? And I, is there an expectation that I need to make a certain amount? Secondly, first date rule, consider your audience. And audience should really be considered as, as audiences. Um, the best internal communications plans are not going to consider your audience as sort of one single group. They're going to be very thoughtful about segmenting them into different um, groups. So who do I need to engage to, to deliver on this project? So does your CEO need to be involved? Um, do you have to have finance? Um, is HR, is it a learning and development tool? Do you need to speak to HR about that? What is already in play? What do each of those audiences think? Are they positive or negative about this? Are they likely to be excited? They are, some may be, but you probably are going to come up against some resistance as we saw with the change curve. Even with the greatest idea, you're kind of, you know, potentially bringing something new to the table and people will feel um, maybe a bit worried about that. What do you want them to know about your project? What do you want them to believe? So that's kind of really getting to the sort of emotional aspect. Um, and then also what do you want people to do? So you have to have a clear call to action and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, for any internal communications plan, we really recommend deeply that you build a, a story and a narrative, a story for change. And we'll give you a few um, tools to help you do that shortly. Um, but how can I make what I'm doing meaningful to my audience? How do I make sure that this story is, is credible, that they want to, to listen to it? And again, this idea around call to action is really important. Um, and then finally, your plan, you know, what format do I need to do this? When am I going to do this? Do I need to communicate to different audiences at, at different times? Do I need to brief the CEO and the leadership team before I communicate to 9,000 employees, probably a good idea. Um, you know, so, so think around that. Through which channels? So often my advice to most organizations is if you're doing change to try and use the channels that already exist for you, because we feel very uncomfortable when we're kind of given a new community. The CEO has never communicated you know, by email at all, and then all of a sudden he sends an email about something, that's going to get the hair, the heart pumping a little bit. So try and use channels that you already have. Having said that, innovation lends itself to being innovative. So think about ways that you can bring that to life, and, and Adam will talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And then are there any other things that I need to consider in my plan? So... Those sort of 14 questions, if you can kind of work your way through those, and that can be an exercise that you can do in, you know, 
you've got to quickly go and meet a stakeholder. You could run through that in five minutes, or it's something that you can work on a lot longer, or it would make a fantastic workshop with your project team where you spend a couple of days workshopping that out. But there's enough tools and depth in there for you to really do your planning. And we've also created like this little template that um, you can use this comms plan tool to help you do just that. So the purposes of today, um, we're going to focus on two areas. So the narrative that I talked about, looking at the story, and then also um, working in groups. We're going to give you like a sort of dummy case study for you to work through to just start thinking about um, how you could perhaps write an internal comms plan. So we'll give you some guidance about some of the ingredients that we think are, are important. Um, before I go on, does anyone have any sort of questions or anything currently? Am I talking too fast, too slow? Normally I would be <laughs> in a room with you, so it feels a little bit um, challenging this way, but I'm enjoying it. But yeah, please, I think there's a either shout or send me a chat and I can answer any questions. Or I will proceed. Okay, I'm going to proceed. So, importance of story. So, what we've actually done in this presentation today, and we'll share this with you, as I said afterwards, is we've kind of distilled down five, in addition to the sort of the four point plan, we've also distilled down kind of five big things that we think from a behavioral point of view are really important for internal comms planning. And the first is the simplicity and urgency of story. Um, and the reason why that is, is for a lot of the reasons that Adam shared with you at the outset. So out of that list of sort of 18, 20 words, I can't even remember how many were <laughs> there were now, we could all only really remember between six and 13. So, um, and this is hard to get right, because believe you me, the more stakeholders you involve in your project and the delivery of your project, the more they will all want to go, oh, we better say that and we better add this in. It'd be really important for people that they know this fact. And it can be quite hard actually to get to a, sim a sim simple story. It also needs to have urgency because as we showed earlier, people don't like going through change. Um, and so it needs to really have a real need as to why we're going to, to do this. Um, a really another model that we find really helpful, and again, this one might be a really useful one to also use with your stakeholders as well when you need to sort of help explain some of these things. I think both the change curve and this model are really useful to help kind of crystallize these ideas with other people. It's William Beckard, and he um, looked at the kind of key ingredients for successful change. And looks a bit of a complicated formula, but it's actually very good common sense and really helpful for, for you when you're thinking about how you're going to create this sort of simple, urgent story. So the first thing is you need to have dissatisfaction with the status quo. So you need to make people feel uh, unsure about the current reality. There's some threat, there's some risks, there's something going on. We, you know, we can't stay how we are. If we do, it's not going to quite work out for us. Um, yeah, we've got to change. Um, and we're all living in that at the moment. <laughs> you know, who thought a global pandemic would land on our um, New Year's resolutions this year? So I'm sure you've all kind of, you know, had to accelerate probably some projects around that. Second is you have to set that sort of scene. Then you have to set your vision. So, okay, guys, this is, you know, the, the bit that's not quite great, but don't worry, we've got a brilliant idea. We've got something that we're, was going to ease that pain. So that's your vision. Now, a lot of companies and organizations are very good at maybe C, and they can be very, very, very good at V, very good at painting the future. What sometimes they come unstuck on is F. Um, you could... Uh, I just thought of a naughty thing there about they F it up without thinking about their F. I probably shouldn't say that. But anyway, the F is your first step. So you paint an issue, you set this beautiful vision, and then you fail to put in place the steps. 
in order, and this goes back to the change curve that I shared with you um, earlier, people, if they're faced with D, they're going to get really scared and they're going to go boom. They're faced with V, they might start to go up the change curve a little bit, but then they suddenly realize, hold on a minute, to get to there, I've got to change everything I need to do. How am I going to do that? If you haven't given them some clear steps, some clear um, guidance, some clear reassurance about how you're going to get them to V, that's when you're going to get that really wobbly change curve. And that is where your internal communications plan has to be really thoughtful. It has to have clear steps that you're going to get people to get through. If any of these are kind of, as I said, imbalanced, then that's when you're going to get much more resistance to change. And I guess a, a final tip to give you, um, there is something Adam and I talk a lot about with clients is this concept of the IKEA effect. I don't want to kind of overwhelm you with too much theory, but really it's quite simple. And um, the more you are involved in something, the more you feel connected to it. So for some crazy reason, someone thinks that by building an Ikea and furniture, <laughs> you feel more, more joy. I kind of like to call it the Lego effect rather than the Ikea effect. But in essence, the more people, the more you engage employees around these particular steps, the more likely they're going to be involved with it. So I guess a big key takeaway from this would be do this work, but don't necessarily do it in you know, the war room privately and then kind of announce it where you can engage employees in each of these steps. So do research with them, find out how they're feeling. You know, is your organization innovative enough? Do focus groups, do research. Then you can bring that into your story. You know, ask them what would make work here really great, etc. Good. Okay. So all that is very useful and it also gives you a way to help you develop your story. So those kind of almost like those four, those three steps, dissatisfaction, vision, and your plan are really, if you can kind of almost use that as a bit of a storytelling rule, you're on, onto a winner. So this here is a model and it's um, based on Joseph Campbell. He um, tore apart all of the great stories from Hansel and Gretel to Star Wars and realized that there really is a lot of commonality between how we tell stories. So, you know, think of Luke Skywalker, he's kind of abandoned, he's on his own, he needs to leave, he goes on a big journey, he meets some friends, they help him, but it doesn't go all to plan, so then he has to go on another journey, and then he meets the enemy, he turns out to be his dad, and you know, he has all these calamities, but in essence, he's going on a journey. He is the hero and he goes on the journey and there's lots of things that he has to do in order to save himself. Same with Hansel and Gretel, you know, they leave their wicked stepfather who's going to, you know, cut them up. They go into the forest to get saved. You know, then they meet the witch and get put in the house. So you think you're going to be okay and then something else happens. And that is the ingredients of good storytelling. And that really, for your change project, is what you should be thinking about. So number one, as I said, what's the current world we live in? You know, what's happening in our organization that means that we need to change? What's going on that we need to, to uh, fix? Or, you know, what's, what's going to cause us problems? Are our people unhappy? Are we stuck in a rut? Are, we, are our competitors going to gobble us up for breakfast? Is our share price tanking? What, what's the issue? Um, secondly, then, what's the vision? So, okay, we've got, we're going to this we're going to grow market share we're going to launch a new product we're going to have a new idea and um, chapter three as i said is your first step so we've got a plan to do this this is what we're going to do we're going to put in place a new tool we're going to give everyone training we're going to um give everyone uh you know a bonus if you do brilliantly on this and then chapter four really important is that call to action from telling people your story, what is it exactly that you want them to do now? And this can be can be as high level, I you know, as come along with us. We want you to be there with us. We'll give you some more information as we go along. It could be as literal as join us for a call tomorrow. We're going to give you a lot more information about this. But there literally are just those four kind of steps that you need to think about when you're crafting your story of change. 
So I'm going to be really mean now and I'm going to kind of throw you in a little bit at the deep end and I don't expect anyone to come up with Star Wars in the next five minutes. But I do just want you to think a little bit about the project that you yourself are working on. Um, and if you could break it down into those four chapters, um, could you write a little bit about the challenges and risks that you think your organization or your team is, is facing? Could you write uh, a little bit, you know, one or two sentences about your vision? What is it that you're going to do that's going to change this issue? Can you share a little bit about some of the steps that you're going to do to do that? And then finally, what is it like the, the call to action for your employees? So I'm just going to invite you for, for five minutes just to go back to your notepad as, as um, you had earlier and just think about any projects that you're working on. What made you come to this, this workshop today? And can you maybe think about those four buckets? and spend five minutes putting it together and we'll put it on screen so you can see it there. Yeah, oh, exactly. And I was gonna, I'll, I mean, I'll quickly run through this in case in case we didn't have a Brave Western. I was just gonna share some work that we did with um, International Hotel Group. So we applied the same model to them. So their challenging reality was a new competitive environment. Hotels were really feeling the crunch from Airbnb really feeling the crunch from, um, uh, you know, boutique hotels. People no longer wanted like this, you know, big hotel experience. They want something very personal. And um, that was a massive threat to the international um, hotel group. You know, they, so their vision was, you know, we are losing stock. We have to grow. We need to grow. We can't continue like this. So what's our plan? Well, we're going to focus much more on our, on our brand and we're going to really give that um, local feel to our international hotel chain. We, we have the advantage of being able to invest in technology in a way that smaller companies can't. So we're going to really enhance our experience. And we're going to move to a much more regional focus so that we can have a lot more, lot more local experience. And then the call to action, and this was something that the CEO announced, was join me um, and I'm going to give you a lot more information about this plan. And the next um, page is this became, so this came from originally we had this big strategy deck, you know, Deloitte and everyone had been involved and coming up with this plan. We were able to distill it down into these, these four chapters. So where are we now? What do we want to do? How will we do this? And our opportunities. Um, so I just wanted to share that, that with you, real world, how that works. And I think Weston did a much better job than, than I. Um, so I'm just going to hand over quickly now to Adam and Liam, who are going to share uh, a little bit more about some of the key ingredients that we think are important for internal communications change. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so just just to, I guess, kick off the next the next sort of section here is, well, we're all going to talk through these five elements and sort of behavioral science led elements that we know contribute to to successful internal change that the framework is generally that we're not completely rational uh, as, as human beings we do things that seem even if we know that better practices exist right in the workplace and outside of the workplace we don't optimize all the time we're happy to make do with something that's good enough right rather than risking change and it's for lots of reasons that we're not immediately aware of like like you know we showed with the memory game earlier right there are lots of things going on that we're not we're not conscious of um, so these are kind of five things that we've used previously to sort of underpin and support change programs. The, um, the, I'll, I'll very quickly went through them and then we'll go into a bit more detail. So the simplicity and urgency, um, we've already mentioned a little bit. Um, in short, it's that we're, we're exposed to far more information than we could possibly deal with, but also things that are far in the future are generally undervalued relative to things that are present and immediate. Um, the IKEA effect also has been mentioned, which is really, in short, the idea that we really overvalue things that we've been involved in creating. Um, messenger effects, so we don't listen and copy everyone, listen to and copy everyone equally. And there are lots of traits that are involved in determining who we listen to. So think about where things come from. Social norms, so we're sensitive to information about what other people are doing. Um, and living through experience. So um, learning by doing is really useful. And there's lots of research and experiential learning about how if you learn a particular solution to a problem in the right context, then when you reach that context again, then you get those same cues and triggers which 
helps you remember the solution that you originally learned. Um, very, very quickly that was, um, but we'll go into them into a bit more detail now, I think. You're on mute, Vicky. Classic, classic, sorry. <laughs> First thing, we've talked about this before when we were sharing the William Beckard model, but the more you can involve your employees in your program, the more successful it's going to be. So when you're doing your plan, think about how employees can be involved. There's some ways that you can do this. So as we've said, what's your story? Um, and how can you kind of involve employees in, in that? Having a consistent presentation is really important as well. Something that can be shared as, as um, Adam shared earlier, you know, we prefer, um, we remember things as they're repeated. Um, but visual content, what can you do in your internal communications plan that will make, you know, you really stand out. We help clients a lot with kind of the brand of their program. You know, is there a way that um, you can really bring visual content into it? Um, what storytelling can you do? So you have your story for change. How can you get stories of employees that are doing that? So for the example that um, Weston gave, you know, it would be really great if he could find some employees that have used that technology and get them to share the experiences um, and the positive experience and benefits they had from using that technology. What did the customer think? You know, that is going to be much more powerful. That's your IKEA effect in that action. That's going to be much more powerful than perhaps him saying it, saying if there was a client um, that could talk about that as well. Um, how can you get your leaders involved? And we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail in a sec. And then finally, it's easy to get really excited about your launch. And it's really important to do those ongoing updates. And that was what we were sharing with you earlier about the need to have your plan and continually in communicating about your plan, because that is what helps um, soften the, the change curve. Great. Thanks, Vicky. Um, so next, um, we're going to be talking about um, authentic leaders and peers. Um, so as Adam mentioned before, um, you know, we don't just listen to, um, you know, everyone equally. Um, it's a kind of about um, the who. So, for example, tapping into your um, leaders within the organization, those trusted, uh, those trusted leaders that have built up that kind of authentic approach with employees and authenticity is a really key thing when thinking about um, what leaders or what key stakeholders you want to communicate to your organization. Um, you know, they are, they are key in ensuring the success of your project. Um, and, you know, it's really important to remember that, you know, telling a story is one thing, but telling it with feeling and authenticity is another and making employees believe and buy into what um, ultimately you're, you're, you're trying to sell to them. Um, so what we can do in terms of um, supporting leaders and peers is, um, you know, creating, you know, certain materials um, that will enable them to not only connect to the story um, authentically, but tell it um, in a really convincing way as well and engaging employees. So that could be a toolkit that could be setting them up, um, setting up kind of uh, virtual meetings where they can talk openly about a certain project or program. So there are many things that we can do. Um, and, you know, one of the biggest benefits of an authentic leader is the fact that, you know, they are able to faci facilitate, um, you know, the promotion of psychological safety. So that feeling that, you know, you are, you are able to share ideas and collaborate in an open, acceptable space. And that, again, will, um, will promote, you know, innovation within your organization. Um, you know, just one other thing as well, you know, leaders and, you know, certain individuals throughout the organization can engage in pre-existing kind of networks that already exist. Um, so this is a great way of reaching out to um, large groups who are already coming up with really great ideas or innovations within your organization or have people on the ground that they can also influence and get their buy-in as well. So that's just kind of one of the things that we can do, just touching on, you know, the importance of, you know, the leaders and people managers within, um, within an organization. So a sort of related point to that um, about how one might use sort of social information when trying to communicate about these kinds of um, initiatives is that 
more broadly, we're just really sensitive to social information, right? So while in some cases we might want to stand out, I would imagine that all of us probably feel like our preference is always to be distinctive. Particularly when things are uncertain, we tend to look for others for clues about, about what we should be doing, right? So, and it's quite irresistible. So, you know, if just taking this call as an example, if, if you joined and everyone had their camera off, you probably feel a little bit weird about putting your camera on. Um, so just messaging that uses social information, even in quite a minimal and subtle way, like providing some feedback about, you know, maybe it's some kind of comparison internally or externally, where it kind of explicitly shows how people's um, performance or how people's sentiments compare, um, or, just, or just information about what other people are doing, whether it's kind of in statistics and numbers or case studies and things like that, like this particular slide shows, can be really persuasive. So just very briefly to mention that that point and even using a minimal amount of social information can be can be really persuasive someone on mute definitely on mute again it was going to happen eventually sorry everyone um so just kind of um talking around kind of experiencing risk taking and innovation um kind of in a collaborative way and problem solving together um i think you know, we're we're now we're now working in an environment where you know the status the status quo um, no longer no longer stands. And you know, we, we if an organisation is looking to drive innovation, you know, it's not just telling people to innovate. It's about showing them how they can innovate. And there are many different platforms that exist currently that um, that enable that. Um, so, you know, I think. At the moment, the way we're working, you know, is an email really going to cut through the noise and engage people and, you know, give them the, give them the inspiration and that call to action they really need? Probably not. So the idea is that, you know, there are, you know, certain channel applications that, you know, you can that enable um, large groups of employees to to communicate ideate collaborate um, within organizations and you know these are just some of the examples that we've um, that we've done recently um, especially during lockdown where you know we've enabled employees within an organization to share information collaborate and really drive innovation internally so for example the first one is with um, marketplace for nestle so that's 55,000 employees um, that use that platform and that's kind of their central hub for all of their information and tools and resources that enable them to go out and you know deliver in markets and launch new products Secondly, you know, um, we've uh, worked with six financial financial information, um, kind of um, driving uh, innovation internally um, around kind of uh, their kind of business priorities. So working with them on that, and also we've um, utilised um, teams with um, a pharmaceutical company um, to uh, hold a kind of four day. Um, kind of interactive and collaborative event um, via teams that had live content, pre-recorded content, um, but a really great way of bringing employees together from, um, from across the globe and from different markets. So those are just, I guess, a, a few things to remember when you're thinking about your plan. So, um, you know, how am I going to involve leaders and which leaders are going to be the most persuasive and the most helpful for me to get my project off the ground. Um, are there groups of um, employees already that might be really interested in, in this project? So thinking about Weston's idea, you know, are there some real, you know, photographers in the business that he could engage that would be really great to help tell his story? Um, most of us are probably working from home in some capacity. If we're not, it's probably because we're in a construction site or somewhere, so we don't necessarily have access to um, normal channels. So what can um, we use to communicate? Um, and then just thinking about, you know, particularly if our kind of theme is innovation and we are much likelier to adopt innovation if we take an innovative approach and if we bring sort of a bit of risk taking into it, what can, what can we do? Is it some kind of live event or something that is maybe a little bit extraordinary? Um, so lots of ideas and I know you've all come from lots of different organizations and you will all have, I guess, different channels at your disposal, different audiences. So we wanted to just get you to think a little bit together 
uh, but in smaller groups. Um, we're going to give you a, 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 a dummy exercise, but we would like to you to, to bring some of your own experiences. And we find that when people come together and share a little bit and talk about the, the challenges that they're facing, that it really helps. So whilst we're giving you a, a shared project to plan around, you know, do you think a little bit about your own projects and some of your own experiences? Um, so I'm going to get at, um, Liam just to talk through what will happen over the next sort of 10, 15 minutes. I think I think that's probably everyone. Um, did anybody have any uh, any kind of initial comments? Any kind of how how did everyone find that exercise? I appreciate this the groups were you know a little bit quite large, but um, how did everyone find it? Yeah, it was good. It was a useful exercise. Um, it's uh, we didn't have a lot of time, I suppose, so we were under a bit of bit of pressure. Yeah, this is this is definitely um, an exercise that we could spend uh, uh, a full a full workshop on. But I hope just having at least these kind of checklist of questions and these um, grids for you will be really helpful. Like I said, just sit down at your desk, cup of tea, scan them out, and think about your own project you're doing. And then also use it as a facilitation tool if you need to engage your leaders or other departments. One of the things we were talking about in our group was, you know, thinking that launching a customer bot or some kind of innovation project, you're probably going to need to think about, you know, procurement or IT or HR, not just the people that are going to use the tool, but how can you bring other people with you? And I think doing a, an exercise with those groups maybe as part of your kind of journey will be really useful as well as thinking about how you're going to communicate to them. So as I said we'll share these with you so that you can kind of print them off or, or use them um, uh, at your at your sort of convenience. Um, so I do appreciate that we've really kind of kind of gone through everything very quickly today and probably gave you quite a lot of information. Um, we'll share the deck with you um, as well and happy to, you know, we'll share our contact details as well if you have any questions or, or want us to talk to you a little bit more deeply about some of the things that we shared. But if there's any questions on the chat, I'd be very happy to take any. Or shout them out, <laughs> whoever, whatever is best. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Hi, Andy. Oh, uh, hi, hi. Um, yeah, it was basically just um, in terms of the. Oh, oh no. Ah, oh, cliffhanger. No. <laughs> <laughs> Taking storytelling to heart. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, is my is my signal going a bit funny? Yeah, you left us with a cliffhanger. I was saying you oh. took the storytelling to heart. So yeah, yeah, it was, it was basically what? How do you define the difference between sort of you know defining the steps that you're going to undertake and and sort of you know defining the call to action really? I suppose I'm a bit unclear about what yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think really the steps you're going to take in your plan is really your sort of strategy and your call. Cool that action can probably change depending on the conversation you're in. So you will always have um, a clear strategy for what you're doing. So if we took Weston's example, you know, for him, it's about making sure that he can get the technology into, you know, he needs to have the technology, he needs to have the cameras, he needs to have the software, he needs to have the training. That's his plan. His call to action. If he's talking to um, the CEO, it might be, you know, uh, listen to me, this is going to save you X pounds. Or if he's talking to uh, a site worker, you know, uh, this is so easy, you just need to send me an email and I'll send you the camera. So your strategy, your first step, your, your point three in the story wheel is probably always the same, but your call to action might change depending on where you are in time. So if you're launching your strategy, it might be 
um, it might be a video message and you're saying to people tomorrow join my all hands where I'm going to talk you into this in more detail if you're further down your journey it might be you know we're seeing some this is the plan this is the challenge we had this is where we're getting to this is our plan and actually we've got some really strong results already we're six months in you know come and I'm going to share those with you so that's the, the difference okay thanks thank you um, I can't say that surname. I'm not Gangala. So sorry if I say this awfully, but how to sustain the momentum of the innovation programs after the initial buzz? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a big thing, and that's why thinking about that um, model is so important. That you don't do a lot of kind of hype. You don't focus so much on the vision. Um, I think that's where storytelling, um, not just the story around your change, but actually how people are um, living the innovation. So whatever program you've done, continually finding people that are seeing results in that, whether that's customers, whether that's employees, um, will be a really important way to, to keep that going. Um, I think there are advantages in the current digital climate. You know, we've seen such massive acceleration of, of platforms that we've all been kind of championing for such a long time, I, idea drop being one of those. You know, um, people are more open, I think, to using technology in a way that they weren't before. So I think that is also um, very useful in kind of sustaining conversation. Um, but I think making sure that you're continually reminding people through, you know, stories of benefit and showing people, you know, how they've done. What a client that we're working with actually at the moment, um, because for them, their culture is so risk averse. One of the things that we're doing is not just helping them find stories about successes, but we're also helping them to tell stories about where people have tried things and it hasn't worked out because we want them to know that um, being brave is a really important part of um, being an innovative culture and being willing to, to, to accept risks and that things might fail. So that might be another interesting um, kind of direction for you to think about is not just telling all the, the brilliant stuff, but also being really honest about where things haven't worked out and why, but because of that, we've learned, we've learned this. Awesome. Thank you. Go out and vote, Miss Alabama. We had some we had some Americans yeah. in our team, so if we, we're in, encouraging them to, to to get out. Yes, I'll be voting. I'm going right now. <laughs> Thank you. Already <laughs> voted. <laughs> to you. That's great. Bye everyone. It's so lovely to meet you all. I wish it was in a room, but I think this was this was this is this is a great second second option.